Ralf? So I was muted, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello, thank you very much for the invitation <laughs> and um, for the chance to talk a bit about experiences from my working group um, of light pollution and regulations in Germany. Um, well, I want to start that um, there are, oops, why isn't this working? Um, do not have specific regulations against adverse effects of light emission in Germany, but we have several regulations within building construction um, orders um, and regulations in several laws. And some of them I want to present here. There's the nature and landscape protection uh, um, under German law, and um, we do have some legal for alterations or impact or changes that affect the shape or the functionality of landscapes um, um, and the performance of those. Um, and streetlight can be one of these um, um, alterations. Um, the impairment is determined by the number of quality in affected species or habitats. And if something, an impairment occurs, occur, there are legal obligations and they cascade. So first of all, these have to be avoided. Secondly, um, there shall be a compensation if they cannot be avoided. So that, for example, the streetlight is um, impairing eco important ecosystems. You might give some offset to um, dark sky parks um, to create better um, uh, landscapes there. And if all of this does not work, then an offset payment is regulated by the authorities if they approve the um, alteration of the landscape. Um, secondly, we have the law of um, the Emission Control Act, in which um, all emissions are regulated. That um, um, Air pollution, for example, noise is regulated in this Emission Control Act, but also the emission of lighting. Outdoor lighting is in most cases not obliged to approval, but nevertheless harmful environmental effects um, have to be minimized or avoided. Um, the protection includes human, animal, plants, soil, water, culture, and other material um, assets. So culture could be also the nightscape. Um, however, from this Emission Control Act are excluded all non-commercial purposes, which is private lighting, for example, illumination in gardens, and also public street lighting. Um, if it's not commercially done by companies. But in most cases, it's done run publicly, and then the street lighting is exempt from the Emission Control Act. There is what we heard about today many times. <clears throat> we have several norms for lighting, and the 13201 is the street lighting norm, which is a technical recommendation. In some country, it serves. Um, as a law. In Germany, it does not. It is a recommendation for minimum requirements for public lighting and specifications of technical prerequisites. In Germany, the um, consortium is from the Dean Office. The Dean Office is established, um, supported by the state, for consumers so that um, the technology has a minimum standard. And this is what this committee does. They are delegates from more than 66% from the industry. So it's basically the manufacturers that give out 
technical re recommendations how much light there should be at least on the street to secure safety. The problem is this is um, private. It is an association. It does not have enough stakeholders from different um, subjects and um, it lacks democratic legitimacy and therefore it has no legal le legislative power at least in Germany. I know it's different in some other countries. But we have two laws, I just explained them to you, um, but they are very broad and very unspecific in terms of light emission. So the unspecific um, regulation from these laws for nature protection and emission control stayed behind very detailed technical standards because for the security um, the um, communities are obliged to, to get, get at least the amount of light which is in the norm. So although it is not the law, it's often taken as if it was the law. And we did a publication together with the University of Münster. Uh, Benedict Huggins was um, heavily involved in this. He's a um, 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 lawyer for um, um, environmental law. And uh, we um, together um, summarize the protection gaps that exist for light emission and adverse effects on ecological land and um, ecological systems and uh, landscape. So the protection of habitat is spatially limited and would require an individual, individual impact assessment for lighting systems, which does not exist. The protection of special protected species required an adverse effect, such as injury, death, or avoidance behavior. A lot of the adverse effects that we see are indirect. So you have them on one species and the other species cannot feed anymore because there's lack of food. I will go into this much, much more later. So what is in the law said, what is an uh, adverse effect, often exclude um, adverse effects from artificial light at night. Um, then most provisions require either a significant increase in killing risk or a significant decline of a local population. And both criteria are also in um, artificial light at night related situations hard to um, assess. Um, and then in the natural lands and um, nature and landscape law, species and landscapes without special protection. So um, that have not a certificate for being protected or not on one of the, uh, the endangered lists. They um, are often not affected by the um, protection. And now I want to go into night as a living space and how important the darkness is for ecosystems and for species. Um, here's a list um, showing the percentage of um, animal groups that uh, use the night niche. They have adapted their senses to the dark um, uh, light um, um, situations and they can be heavily disturbed by artificial light at night. And you see that this is um, in some animal groups a pretty high percentage. Um, here is pointed out the bats which have special um, protection status um, and um, amphibia, in which is also a high um, amount of species um, specially protected, but all the others, like mammals, also 63, uh, over 63% are night active. And a lot of the species, especially also with invertebrate um, species, do not have any protection status. But they are rather important for ecosystem services. Um, there are um, several um, studies showing that um, the nighttime service of pollination is highly important also to provide um, service for the daytime pollinators. So the study by Knopp et al. Um, done in 2017, they showed that with street lighting in um, a region, there was a certain plant 
not pollinated by nighttime pollinators. And um, this food source uh, was then lacking for the daytime pollinators. So this had an impact on the whole ecosystem and how the functioning even of daytime active pollinators. We do have a loss of biodiversity and um, there's a high loss of um, insects. Uh, in Germany, we have the Insect um, Protection Act now active for the next four years. And um, this is because of some studies showing that uh, over 70% of the biomass is declining. And we um, blame a lot the landscape um, architecture, the landscape use and daytime activities for this, but also a nighttime problem. And to um, assess um, the impact of certain installations of light is really hard. And I want to go in certain um, groups of um, animals here and show you um, that it is um, not related to the law um, for nature um, um, protection. Like, for example, for bats, the movement in areas can be heavily um, um, disrupted by artificial light at night. Um, highly sensitive bats can be impacted up to 50 meter in an illuminance below one lux. And also the drinking activity was seen that it's in most species um, um, reduced um, and some species do not drink at all when they are cut off from the next um, source of water. With birds, we do have an impact on migrating birds and um, this is very hard to assess um, how big the impact is at what time. Um, now it's shown that um, on certain migration status, um, the um, birds are more affected by um, air, um, light pollution than at others, but basically um, the migration routes um, go over heavily polluted areas. Um, Artificial light uh, can induce changes in indiv individual hormonal phenotypes and the species react differently to this. But uh, what can be shown is there um, with white um, artificial light at night, there is high levels of activity. Um, they have sleep deprivation and uh, the disease dynamics of free living songbirds can be um, increased. Someone has to mute the microphone, please. Can you please mute your microphone? Um, here I'm showing some um, studies showing effects on landscapes and ecosystems and um, how important it is that we save areas um, for the services of ecosystems. Um, Garrett et al, they show that um, um, about half of key biodiversity areas are impacted by artificial light at night. And um, this means there is an um, impact on certain services. And Kobizic, um, Kobizic sorry, Maya, I, still learn your name, although we worked together for a long time, um, uh, showed that the, the, the growth of paraphyton, so the very basic of ecosystems um, resources, um, the, the new growth in aquatic systems can be impaired by certain lights. And um, as more we have key biodiversity, the areas disturbed by lighting, we do not know yet how much this will impact the whole ecosystem surface. Uh, we know that there is a high impact on the um, composition and that some predators oh, and uh, scavengers can um, benefit from the no, biomass super. that is uh, attracted <laughs> to the lights. And um, this can cascade in riparian food web and can disturb whole ecosystems. There are several studies, and I just mentioned three here, showing that for most species and for most landscapes, there is the possibility to use 
different light of co um, color of light or um, uh, low intensity of light. So we can provide artificial light, but still do not have the main effects or less effect. Like for, a co uh, for example, for toads, red light is less disturbing than white light um, when they are mi migrating. Um, and, and Maya also says understanding the contribution and the um, um, uh, contribution of artificial light and um, how we use it can save insects and um, landscapes. And um, yeah, certain light sources um, are key sources to mitigate and minimize ecological impact. So we come to the solutions and they are pretty even for most um, stakeholders, so even astronomers won't say different things. Right now, if you have, for example, a camping place in a nat natural park or a protected area even, they can assume in, illuminate their parks like on this picture. Really bright, you need to find your way, you need to find the reception and you shouldn't trip over anything, so there's a lot of light needed. But what we can do is we can guide the light to where we need it. Full cutoff, full, full stop. Um, we can use l warm light colors. There's no reason why we should use blue, high blue content light unless you work outside or you maybe have to film. But in most cases, in public lighting, we do not need cold uh, colors. So we can reduce the um, color temperature apply the lowest light intensity necessary. We do not really know how low we can go because our eyes are able to adapt very well to darkness. And if there's no disturbing points by brightness, we can lower the intensity much further than we know already. But lowering them, the lights about 50% won't harm anybody because most persons won't even see it. Um, and then to implement requirement profiles helps on regional plans, you might have to justify why you need the light and um, show your traffic or visitors numbers in the dark phase. And then make sure right now you have to show, make sure that you have enough light with a street lighting norm for visitors that might come during the whole day, 24 hours. But actually what we need is that you say how many traffic and visitors you have in the dark phase, and then you have to show that you really need this lighting and that it's not just turned on with no use. And then last but not least, we have to measure the brightness. And like we do for climate change protection, where we say, this is the status right now, the CO2 consumption. We don't want to increase it, we want to decrease it. We can do the same for light pollution. We do have a disturbance right now in certain areas. We do not want to become, let it become worse. What we have just seen in the previous talk is that more and more lighting points, points are sold and that we have more and more consumption of energy because of lighting, which is actually not needed. And we need to regulate this. And one major thing is we need standardized measurements to show that our area's landscapes are not brightening more and more. So, and if we do all of this, then we have a um, camping site like this. We can enjoy the stars, we can see where the reception is, and we can even talk outside and find our way. Um, a lot of these recommendations are done with a whole lot of concerns here, a lot sitting here in the working uh, or um, taking part in this workshop are from um, the Loss of the Night Network, which was active from 2012 to 2016. And the website is still active and you can find the recommendation and also legislation from certain countries um, on this website. Um, we recently have published um, in German um, a guide for um, the new installation and modernization of outdoor lighting system to assist um, communal uh, authorities in decision making in showing that there needs to be 
regulation in showing how the regulation could look like and um, maybe implementing um, regional um, regulation. And there's also this publication by Benedict Huggins and our working group and the Federal Environmental Agency showing the shortcoming of legislated um, for the protection against the adverse effects of artificial light at night. I want to invite you to work with it. Um, yeah, but my take home message for you is we need desperately regulations against adverse effects of outer lighting. We need them on European level, national and regional level. Um, thank you. And if you want to get in contact, here's my address. Open for questions. <laughs>